of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, this is the second week of Advent. We are fast approaching the coming of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Baby Jesus in the manger in the grotto at Bethlehem. The scripture today reminds us again that the great prophet Saint John the Baptist is preparing the way for the Lord with his preaching and penance in the region of the River Jordan. John, the one who baptized Jesus Christ in his holy waters and himself identified the Lord as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Now, strangely, he is in prison. Whilst in prison, he sends two of his disciples to Christ to question him, saying, Art thou he that art to come, or look we for another? We can unpack this mystery to your brothers and sisters in Christ and learn some concrete principles from the passage to help us in these times when the Catholic Church, as we know, is suffering its passion and hanging on the cross with Christ himself. We can ask ourselves this first question, why was John the Baptist in prison? If you know the scripture, which you should as Catholics, he was in prison and lost his life because he had rebuked King Herod for his adulterous marriage with his brother's wife. We read in the beautiful Gospel of St. Matthew. Truth, as the proverb says, is certainly a very beautiful mother, but she usually bears a very ugly daughter, hatred. St. John then experienced that speaking the truth very often arouses hatred and enmity against the speaker. Let us learn from him to speak the truth always, when duty requires it, even if it brings upon us, which it will do now, great misfortunes. For if with St. John we patiently bear the persecutions, which the gospel message is today, with St. John we shall become martyrs for Jesus Christ and the truth. Ask ourselves another question. Why did John, John the Baptist, then send disciples to Christ? That they should learn from Christ, who had become illustrious by his teachings and miracles, that he was really the promised Christ, the Messiah, the Savior of the world, whom they should follow now. Why did Christ say to the disciples of John, go and say to John, the blind see and the lame walk? that they should by his miracles judge him to be this very Messiah, because the prophets had predicted that he would work such miracles. Christ, says Saint Cyril, proved that he was the Messiah by the grandeur as well as the number of his miracles. Just check out the evangelists and the gospels full of miracles of Jesus Christ, miracles which still happen today. Preparing the way means then to reflect into the silence of our hearts and prepare a regal or a kingly throne for the coming of baby Jesus this Advent. This journey will involve, no doubt, the cross. We must suffer the passion individually as our Lord and the Church as his mystical body. We cannot escape the cross. The foundation of our prayer life is sustained by our sacrifices and a life of self-denial and mortification. You can tell somebody who has the spirit of prayer, they will have a firm foundation of self-denial and mortification. Take up your daily cross then and bear your sufferings with patience, we learn today. By this patience you can save your soul and many other souls, even if you have to Drag them to paradise, kicking and screaming. Why does in the epistle today, St. Paul teach? What does he teach? He says God called a God of patience and consolation and of hope. He is called the God of patience because he awaits our repentance. Our consolation because he gives us grace to be patient in crosses and afflictions. 
Remember, the Lord is waiting for your conversion. The conversion of one soul is greater than the creation of a thousand universes. So the great Saint Augustine tells us, because God gives us his grace to be patient in crosses and afflictions, and so consoles us in our interior lives that we become not faint-hearted. And hope because he gives us the virtue of hope and because he desires to be himself the reward that we are to expect after this life. We cannot see what is going on around us, the spiritual battle, which is good because we would be petrified. God also gives us the consolation in sufferings. The God of patience and of comfort, the God of hope will fill you with all joy in peace in believing, Romans chapter 5. What gives us the greatest consolation then in adversities? The strong and fervent belief that each and everything that happens to us comes to us from our, for our own good, from God himself. And whatever evil befalls us is by the positive will or the permission of God. Good things and evil, life and death, poverty and riches are all permitted by God. It says, we read in the Beautiful verse in Job in the scripture, if we have received good things at the hand of God, saith the pious Job in his affliction, why should then we not receive evil? We should be full of persuasion that without the permission of God, not a single hair of our head shall perish, much less than any other evil be done to us by man or the devil. We should have a steadfast confidence that if we ask him, God, can and will assist us in our sufferings, if it be for our salvation. Can a woman forget her infant so as not to have pity on the son of her womb? If you then, brothers and sisters, deny the crosses in your life, the daily crosses, they will become a heavier burden. If you accept the cross of life, especially with the Blessed Virgin Mary, the crosses will become lighter more bearable and even sweet. No other le way leads to the kingdom of heaven than the way of the cross, which Jesus Christ himself, his sorry mother, and all the saints have trod. Ought Christ to have suffered these things and so to enter into his glory? Through many tribulations, then trials and crosses, we must enter the kingdom a paradise, and we should not forget that sorrows and adversities are a great sign of God's love for us and manifest proofs of being his chosen ones. God sends the cross to those who he loves. Luke chapter 9 reminds us in conclusion, and he said to all, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever will save his life shall lose it, and he shall not lose his life for my sake, shall save it. For what is a man advantaged if he gain the whole world and lose himself and cast away himself? Arm yourselves then in the spiritual battle which the church is battling today. Look at what is happening all around us now. This is the greatest spiritual battle we are going through in the church now. Remember, it says though in scripture, if you enter into this battle, the greater the sin is, more grace abounds. The church then must speak out on moral issues and the pastors to protect the lives of the faithful. Remember too that God is the author of the sciences and governs over them. The devil, it appears, is running circles around the world. Never has there been so much confusion, even to the extent where the bishops themselves, our pastors who guide the flock, cannot agree on moral issues as to whether it is permissible to take one or a choice of these rapidly produced vaccines we are facing now. We have to know, if we can, do some research on what is going on and ponder the moral principles. We cannot do an evil in order to achieve a good. We cannot, as the moral principle also of restitution, receive something from the destruction of an unborn child and receive a good because 
the unborn child, if it has been violated by the decisions of the parents, belongs to God, and it cannot be used down the line for our benefit. This is the principle of restitution. These are the moral issues we are facing at this time. The whole situation in relation connected to the vaccines can be summed up in one word, sinister. If you don't know what this means, sinister means making you feel that something bad or evil might happen in the future. This is what we want to discuss now, this situation with this vaccine. If you have done any research, you know that the things, the components to avoid in these vaccines is a component called MRC5, which is Medical Center Research Stem Line 5, which is from a lung tissue from an aborted male Caucasian baby, and also another component called HEK293. The virus, or the vaccine, sorry, that is being proposed in this country in itself is morally okay because it has not been produced using one of the li these lines, but it was tested using the MRC5. What can we make of this situation today if we look at the moral issue? And this is the teaching of Catholic bishops and cardinals. Bishop Brennan of Fresno in California recently warned Catholics to avoid any vaccine connected to abortion in any way. Mentioning the vaccine by name that is being rolled out now in this country, he said, Brennan, we must always and only pursue vaccines that are ethically and morally acceptable. Another bishop from the US, a very good holy bishop, Bishop Strickland of Tyler, Texas, has warned his people via a Twitter that one of the vaccines saying it is not morally produced. He repeated his call to halt production of vaccines using aborted babies. He tweeted in April that if a vaccine for the virus is only attainable if we use body parts of aborted children, then he said, I will refuse to take the vaccine. He said, I will not kill children to live. The bishop then publicly reissued this rejection of such vaccines. I renew my call that we reject any vaccine that is developed using aborted children, he said. Even if it originated decades ago, it still means a child's life was ended before it was born, and then their body was used, as it were, as spare parts. Also, in a public letter issued in May, Archbishop Carlo Maria Vigano, along with Cardinals Muller, Punyat and Zen taught that for Catholics, for Catholics, you and me, it is morally unacceptable devel to develop or use vaccines derived from material from aborted fetuses. He said something else more important, Archbishop Vigano and these bishops, they said that citizens must be given the opportunity to refuse these restrictions on personal freedom without any penalty whatsoever whatsoever being imposed on those who do not wish to use the vaccines. That means that we cannot be compelled in conscience to use these vaccines. Bishop Athanasius Snyder, what did he say? He said he's an auxiliary bishop in Astana in Kazakhstan. He said in an interview in relation to the vaccines that mandatory vaccines are the last step of Satanism to legalize abortion globally, the killing of unborn babies, so that the entire planet will be collaborating in the process of killing babies through the vaccine, which we will use parts, spare parts of your brothers and my sisters aborted babies. He also continued, we must resist very strongly against this. If it comes, we must even accept like John the Baptist today, to stand up for the truth and be martyrs. Even without the moral argument in relation to this vaccine, we, 
this is not just the whole issue. We have to look at either other issues in this pie, as it were. There is other issue, issues to consider. How is it possible that three of these vaccines have been developed and produced in rapid time or to come to fruition at the same time in the matter of months? These things, I'm not a scientist, but what I understand that these should be developed over five or 10 years to be tested in the laboratories, scientific experimentation under different hypotheses, etc., using normally animals. What have we done? We have developed these in months, so no doubt there has been shortcuts. Do we know the side effects of these vaccines? No. We know one of the companies has written in the contract that they are not, will be not liable for any comebacks if there is any side effects. We do not know even now if the vaccine once taken can then be transmitted by that person with their already immune to another person. We couldn't be in a position in the future where people are receiving the vaccine and yet there is still another lockdown. This is what we are facing now. Also, we do not know we have these draconian measures we are facing, we have been under over the last few months. For a vaccine, looking at a vaccine for a virus which is less fatal than the common flu. The vaccine is a means then of the control of the people. Without even mentioning some theories in relation to the apocalypse and the mark of the beast, we finish to say that we should fear the vaccine more than the virus. Fear the vaccine more than the virus. In light of all of these unknowns said, then do you, in short, want to be a guinea pig and offer yourself up for one of these vaccines? You have your own free will. You make the choice. But I go back to the word we used before at the beginning of this discourse. This whole episode seems sinister. What do we have to do? We have to beg God to send the true vaccine. The true vaccine is the Blessed Virgin Mary and to be in a state of sanctifying grace. Take the true God-given vaccine, sanctifying grace in the mantle of Mary. This is a spiritual battle for your very soul. In this hysteria we see now in the world, you cannot escape the battle by being a pacifist or a conscientious objector. By default, you must take up the arms offered to you. In these perilous times then, do not Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, do not lose hope. Think of the purity of the Blessed Virgin Mary and her Immaculate Conception. Ponder this mystery this week, which we celebrate the solemnity on Tuesday, where Our Lady is not just white, but whiteness herself. It's not just pure, but purity herself. This will fill you with great hope. Pray to our Immaculate Queen in conclusion, to come with her son, Jesus Christ, now, please God, to save the world from the prince of darkness. This is our hope and desire. Lord, make haste, come quickly and deliver us. This is our Maranatha. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Put on the mantle, then, of the Blessed Virgin Mary and consecrate yourself and your whole family to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. This will help you to put on Jesus Christ and prepare the way for his second coming when he will appear for you as a merciful Lord and take you to your true home paradise where you can gaze on the blessed Trinity forever and ever and ever. Amen. May the holy names of Jesus and Mary be blessed now and forever in the name of the Father and of the Son.